Yes. All right, guys, it's five o'clock. Welcome. So glad to see you all here. Most of you I know because you're my students, but not all of you. Um, I am thrilled to introduce to you Val Swisher. Val comes to us from Northern California. Um, and she is the author of this wonderful little book. She's authored several, but this one is um, all about global content strategy. And one of the reasons I'm holding it up is because if you're, if you're one of the target people in 2800, in other words, you haven't taken a bunch of three and 4,000 level courses yet, you'll get some exposure to the content in this book um, when you get to the content strategy class. Um, she is truly a world expert on this topic. And we're thrilled to have her here to spend a few minutes. I promised my students really only one thing, and that is that we would quit. Um, it's not really 5 o'clock. It's 4 o'clock. They haven't changed the time here yet. Right. But we will quit at 10 till. Okay. Because that's the end of class. All right. So I, I have actually made them stay a little later on a couple of occasions. I promised them I that won't we do would that not too. do that. No. So. Um, so mm. let me get out of the way. I'm going to talk really fast, <laughs> really <laughs> super duper fast. <laughs> let me introduce Val. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. All right. Well, I'm really excited to be here with all y'all. That's Texan. <laughs> it's in the book. All y'all. Um, I wore green. I wore green. My son is a junior here also, so I've been around the campus. Um, this presentation is a little different than what I usually do because I wanted to tell you a little bit about how I got started in the industry and a little bit about what I do, and that dovetails nicely into global content strategy. And I really want you to ask me questions. And I know your personalities because I'm a tech writer, so we don't like asking questions. We prefer not to talk. We want to bond with our screen and our specs. But really, ask me whatever questions come up for you, and I'll try to answer them and be on time. I get that. This is me. <laughs> I, 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 that's me a few years ago. Um, I am the founder and CEO of a company called Content Rules. I will get to that in a bit. I am considered an industry expert. I think that just means I'm old. That's really what that means. It means I'm old. I have written three books. Uh, one of them is on network management. Another one is on um, voice over IP. And the third one is on global content strategy. I speak a lot. In fact, I'm going from here to speak at another conference soon. And then I'm running a conference in Silicon Valley in another three weeks, speaking there. I just spoke in Seattle at Localization World two weeks ago. So I'm always, always speaking. Always speaking. I never talk about my academic background because, frankly, nobody cares. Because when I was your age, there was no such thing as techcom, and there was no such thing as the internet. I know, I'm old. So I went to Tufts University. I did really well. Okay. <laughs> I majored in social psychology, and I majored in music, and I went to the New England Conservatory as a jazz piano major. And then I went on to do master's degree coursework at Santa Clara University in marriage, family, and child counseling. So you can see that that has a lot to do with TechCom. <laughs> but I can tell you that I use my marriage, family, and child counseling skills on a daily basis. A daily basis. It's very helpful. But that's my academic background. <laughs> my work history, I got out of college with a degree in social psychology, and my mother said, don't come home, bye-bye, I'm done. And I said, great, <laughs> thank you. And uh, I had two job offers. One was to stay at Tufts and work in the social psychology department. And the other was to go to work as, as a secretary for an IBM mini computer reseller. And I took the scarier path because I knew what life would be like if I stayed. And that was sort of, you know, the fork in the road. I had a few jobs. Um, eventually, I ended up managing technical training for a company that was called Synoptics, which later became Nortel and finally went out of business in about 2002. But when I was a manager of technical training, I had 16 writers that worked for me. And 
five of them were contractors. And they were making a lot of money. I knew how much they were making. I was paying them. And they were constantly late with their deliverables. And their writing just sucked. And I thought, you know, all I have to do is deliver good quality on time and I can make as much as these people? Oh, I'm totally into that. I'm totally doing that. So in 1994, long before you were born, I started my company. And uh, we've been in business ever since, going on 25 years. We have worked with hundreds and hundreds of customers, all of the names that you know. Facebook, Google, Adobe, Sony, um, I don't know, keep naming them. We, we're based in Silicon Valley. That's our playground. That's where we started. That's where we are. We've done thousands of projects. Thousands. I mean, when, when you're in the business as long as I have, you stop counting. Right? We have two little marks that may or may not be meaningful to you guys, but they're on the slide anyway. One is we're the exclusive licensee of the Rockley st st Strategic Method. That is uh, a specific content strategy methodology that is really aimed towards DITA and XML. We work with customers on content modeling, on content reuse, structured authoring, taxonomy, workflow, going from an unstructured environment where we create monolithic content to a structured environment where we create small, reusable chunks of content. A lot of companies are moving that way. They don't know what to do. We're also the North American service provider for a piece of software called Acrolinks. Um, has anyone heard of Acrolinks? You probably haven't. Acrolinks is, uh, it's, people call it a spell checker on steroids. It is a natural language processor, so it has an artificial intelligence engine. We can take a customer's style guide or style guides and program all of those rules into the software. We can take their terminology, program all those rules into the software, all the terminology into the software. As a writer is creating content, they click a button and it says, <laughs> you use passive voice. <coughs> oh, you're supposed to use a contraction and you didn't. <coughs> right? You use the wrong term for whatever. It's a very complicated piece of software to deploy. It's very simple to use. Here's just a few of our customers over the years. GoPro, eBay, NetApp, SAP, Sony. You guys use Blackboard. I know you use Blackboard. Google, Facebook. So, been there and done a lot of that. Now, one thing I should say about my company before I go on is that I started as a contractor because right? I knew that these people were making a lot of money and they were not doing a good job. My company is a contract company. I have in my database about 3,000 technical writers of whom I work with a couple hundred over and over and over and over and over and over again. So my model is to build a team of one or more writers, usually an editor and perhaps an artist, an illustrator, someone who's going to do the graphics. Back in the day, we also did desktop publishing to make sure that those, those PDFs looked good. Not quite as much of that anymore. Okay, so that's my model, is to really work with an outsourced group of people. So we do four things. One is content strategy, and I consider these four things, the umbrella of what a customer would need in the tech comm arena. So we go in and we help them with everything I talked about before. What have you got? What does it look like? How are you doing this? Right? What tools are you using? How's that working for you? Usually they're gonna call us in because something's not working. Right. Another thing we do is content optimization. That's usually using that fancy software. That fancy software, by the way, is $100,000 minimum. So this is not, some, it's not Grammarly. 
Grammarly is great for a letter. It's not so great if you're working in a corporate environment where brand matters, voice and tone matters, following the style guide matters. Grammarly kind of trails off at that point. But we'll go in and we'll do a linguistic analysis. We'll look at a customer's content versus their style guide. We give it a score. You never get away from being graded because <laughs> from zero to 100, you want 100. You never really get to 100 because it's English, right? I started the company as a content development company. We still do a lot of content development. And it's the third sort of core service area for us. And again, it's writing, it's editing, it's art, it's technical writing, marketing writing, training, e-learning. If, if you need it for your product or service, we can create it for you and all the services that you need. Customers work with us because I can scale up and down quickly because they're all contractors. When things good, they're all working. When things aren't so good, they're not working, right? When a customer needs us, we go in and we get it done. When we're done, we leave. Hopefully, we did a good job and they invite us back, right? I only deal with senior level people. So the people who work for me have a minimum at this point of 10 years of tech -com writing experience. I charge a lot of money for these people's time. A lot of money, like 150 bucks an hour. So I can only work with the most senior of senior people. But you have to get there somehow. You have to get there somehow. And then our fourth area, which is what I'm gonna talk about today, is global content strategy. And um, I like to think I invented the term global readiness because I did, because nobody had said it before I did, and then everybody else thought they said it before I did, but they didn't, because I'm older than them and I was there first. So I realized at some point in, in the scheme of things about eight years ago that we're translating a lot of content now into a lot of languages. So Microsoft translates at last check over 140 languages. Facebook, huge. The woman who runs translation at Facebook used to be at Microsoft. So the crazy number of languages. And I noticed that people were unhappy with their translations. But the problem isn't the translation. The problem is the source. The problem, in our case, is the English. And if we don't write English in a way that's translatable, then when you get to translation, it all falls apart. And we don't think about that enough. I never learned that. It, it's so siloed in the industry that, that the writers are over here and they're doing their thing and you know everything ships and the product ships and they're like, okay, I'm done. And then the translators are over here and they're like, okay, we're starting. What on earth did they do? And, and there's no communication. So I've been running around for a long time trying to get the writing community to understand that we need to have Global Ready English in order to be successful in translation. So that's what we're going to talk about today. We do other things like I'll bring in a bunch of uh, native speakers of different languages and we'll audit translations and we'll tell you which one is good and which one isn't and all that stuff. But the English has to be good. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And um, as Professor Campbell said, I wrote this book called Global Content Strategy. It's really easy. So if you get to the point where you have to read it, it's easy. You can read the whole book in under an hour. And it's snarky, which I bet surprises you. Surprises you? Yeah. Okay. So we're going to talk about global ready content. And then you guys are going to ask me lots of questions, either about global ready content, technical writing, the industry, um, don't ask me what I had for lunch because I don't remember. 
But anything you want, I am here to answer your questions. So. Global Ready content is easy to read. It's really simple. It's simple content. Don't make it more complicated than it needs to be. The simpler, the better. Does anyone know the average reading level in the United States? I didn't hear. High school? Around high school. No. Sixth grade. Oh, I'm sorry. It used to be eighth grade. It used to be eighth grade, but now it's sixth grade. I didn't hear you. Sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> but um, it's sixth grade. Sixth grade. And everyone wants to think my customers are smarter because my product is so much more complicated and, you know, I don't know. They're not. So we need to write simple content. It needs to be unambiguous. I need to understand what you have said the first time. Because let's remember, in the tech comm field, people aren't reading our stuff because they want to. They're reading our stuff because they have to, because they have a job to do. And if they didn't have to, they wouldn't. So everybody who wants to write the next great American novel, I applaud you. And you should totally do that, but not in your TechCom <laughs> documents. And it's optimized for translation, and that's what we're going to talk about. There are ways to write and ways to screw it up when you know your content's being translated. Your content is always being translated. 100% of your content will be translated, either professionally, <laughs> because the company actually pays a translation provider and they have professional people, or someone sending it through Google Translate or Bing Translate. And believe me, if it's not simple, they're doomed. So anyone who says, my content's not being translated, oh, no, 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 it is. It's just that you're not paying attention to the fact that it is. A lot of our readers will have English as a second or third language, again, Simple, 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 simple. If you write global ready content, it, it creates the magic trifecta. The magic trifecta is better, cheaper, faster, and usually we say pick two. You can only ever have two. You can never have all three, but you can when it comes to translation. It improves the quality of all the languages, including English. It saves time. It saves time to write it, actually. It really does. We just want to be simple. It saves time to translate it. it. Saves time for people to understand it. it saves money. It improves comprehension all over the place. So content should be simple to read, easy to understand, inexpensive to translate. It's my mantra. All right, these are the things you got to do. I'm going to talk about each one of them. They may seem straightforward, but for some reason, we don't think about it. Shorter sentences, words, say the same thing, avoid idioms, manage your terminology, and for goodness sakes, use correct grammar. So let's talk about them. This is an actual sentence from a document that I had the pleasure of reading. I changed the model names and company names to protect the innocent. The super secure 950 is also able to work with Acme Manage to efficiently manage and optimize network performance using the GUI. And features such as intelligent radio management, load balancing, inter-AP roaming, and control of security policies and data forward mode allow centralized management of wired and wireless access. And that's not the longest sentence I've ever dealt with. The longest sentence on record for me is 95 words. 26 is your magic number. Why? Because we need a magic number to organize around. If you're using machine translation, 24 is your magic number. Does this mean you can never write a 30-word sentence? No, of course. If, if the product name has eight words in it, you know, the rules change. But this happens all the time. As isn't, is, I don't know what this says. I mean, I could piece it, you know, take it apart and understand. I understand load balancing and AP roaming and all that. 
that sentence doesn't make any sense. So if there's one thing that you leave with, write shorter sentences. That's, that's like people say, what's the one thing? Val, you're talking too much. One thing. 26. 26 words. If you find yourself using commas a lot, it's a problem. Problem. That is the most important piece. It sounds pretty straightforward, doesn't it? Yeah, well. Use fewer words. One of the ways you write shorter sentences is that you use fewer words. My favorite sentence is, first create a new form. Could I create an old form? No. No. I couldn't create an old form. Create a form, period. Create a form. Three words. It's a beautiful thing. Three words is a beautiful sentence. Beautiful sentence. Our software works on a variety of platforms. When you pay for translation, when I send my content to be translated, did you know that you pay by the word? You pay by the word. And depending on the language, it might be as cheap as eight and a half cents a word, and it might be as expensive as 25 cents a word. So if you have thousands and millions of words being translated into 10, 20, 40, 80 languages, the money adds up very quickly, becomes real money, really fast. Say the same thing the same way every time you say it. As boring and redundant as that can possibly be. So we have this button. And there's all kinds of things we can do with this button, right? I can click OK, click on OK, click on the OK button, click the button, click on the button, press OK, press on OK, select the button, tap the button, hit the button. I don't care which one you use. Just use one. Because if you say the same thing the same way every time you say it, many things happen. First of all, your reader doesn't get confused. Is it different if I click on the button then if I select the button, well, no, it's the same thing. OK, well, is tapping? Well, tapping could be different than clicking. Well, OK, right, is pressing the button different than clicking the button? Just say it one way. And in my opinion, use the fewest, the, 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 the fewest number of words that are the least ambiguous. To me, select OK will cover you in everything. Whether you tap, you click, you hit, don't hit, it's not translatable. You cannot hit a button in another language. It makes no sense. But I can always select a button. Select OK, two words. When I send content to translation, as long as I don't change the words, I don't have to pay for it to be translated a second time. Once it's translated, I don't have to pay for it to be translated again. There's a database in translation that's called a translation memory. See, I knew I was going to insult him. <laughs> he told me he was going to leave. I just had to do that. I just had to do that. There's, there, there's a database called a translation memory. And as the translator is translating, what happens is on their screen, on the left side usually is the source, is what you wrote. And on the right side is where they're going to put in their translations. If it's already translated, it automatically pops up. It appears. If you start changing words like press and select and hit and tap, or if it's not a dog, if it's a dog and a canine and a puppy and a snickerdoodle, or, you're going to pay. You're going to pay. You're going to confuse people, and you're going to pay. So the same thing, this, it's harder to do than you think. Because when I was in fourth grade, Mrs. Levin taught me that I should never say the same thing the same way, ever. And I should use the most multisyllabic, complicated vocabulary words I could. That's how you got an A. In tech writing, that's not how you get an A. So I had to unlearn. Even writing college papers, I couldn't 
use the fewest number of simple words. It just didn't work. But in the real world, that's what we need because we're not writing for professors, we're writing for sixth graders. We use a lot of jargon. We don't even know how much jargon we use. Fine tune is jargon. Back to the drawing board, silver bullet, breakdown. We make up words. Daughter board was a made up word. Card that goes on a computer. Um, gamification is a made up word. Now, the words that we make up all of a sudden end up in Merriam Webster <laughs> or the Oxford Dictionary. But pros and cons no, have no idea, believe it or not, that doesn't translate. Breakdown, except a mental breakdown. Which takes me to my soapbox. I have many soapboxes, but I decided to pick this one. Since when is your customer your friend? So back in the day when I started, and we didn't have the internet, and I was at Netscape in 1995 when they did go public, and I was there writing tech docs, but I wasn't an employee, so I didn't get any stock, which is why I'm still working today. We were writing technical documentation for sophisticated products. So we used, you know, the user, blah, 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 blah. We never said you, right? We used third person. It was very dry. Today, we have swung 180 degrees in the other direction. When I go in and work with companies like GoPro, and I work with them on their global content strategy, and they have taglines that make absolutely no sense in English, never mind in any other language. We've changed the way we communicate with our customer. So now our customer is no longer our customer. Now our customer is our best friend. When you buy a product, you're, you expect them to talk to you in your language. Right? It's, it's, it's the new hip way to communicate. There are many problems with this. First of all, in many cultures, they don't want to be your best friend. They just want to be your customer. Right? I was working with um, one of the, it wasn't Fitbit, but one of the Fitbit-ish kind of com customers. You know, they had a watch thing. And the app would say, would say, rise and shine. Rise and shine. That means nothing in any other language, rise and shine. What is rise and shine? It's time to wake up. <laughs> it's time to get out of bed. Rise and shine. So a lot of other cultures don't want to be your best friend. And the best friend vernacular does not translate. Because how we communicate as best friends is very different than how two people in Japan communicate as best friends, or two people in Indonesia communicate as best friends. We don't, we don't know this. And I have customers who call me daily with this dilemma, because the expectation is that we're going to create our content in this best friendy kind of style. I had a customer call me and say, you know, we need to translate our game characters, and our characters are kind of cheeky. And I said, cheeky? Cheeky doesn't translate. You, you have to create completely new content to be cheeky in every language, if cheeky is appropriate. That's my soapbox. What can you guys do about it? Not much, <laughs> unfortunately. Except no, when you're going in, that what you really want is simple, clear instruction, rather than you're my new best friend and, and I'm going to communicate in your language, on your wavelength, whatever that means, because that's not translatable either. We don't communicate on a wavelength, technically. So that's my today's soapbox, brought to you by me. Terminology is really important. Uh, Companies need to manage their terminology. Terminology is closely linked to brand. And if you want to maintain your brand, you have to maintain your terminology. It's very, very important. If you want to maintain your copyrights and your trademarks and your service marks, you actually copyright specific terms. And if you don't use them properly, 
you violate your own copyright. And if you violate your copyright, everybody else can too. So when you manage your terminology, the content's easier to read, you get better, cheaper, faster, you get consistency in all languages. How do you manage your terminology? Well, the unsophisticated way is to have a list of words. And those are the words you use. You only use that list of words. And usually we're talking about product names and trademarks and words you've made up, like Yahoo, which never used to be a word that we would use, Yahoo, or Google. And you know you've arrived when your brand name is used as a verb. Right? My husband said, I'm going to Zillow that. We, look, we were in a neighborhood, there was a house for sale. I'm going to Zillow that. It's like, you are? Wow, OK. Well, let me know how that works for you. When you get more sophisticated, there are terminology management systems that companies put into place. And they are like big databases. If you are in a position where you can influence terminology management, I want you to keep in mind that making a list of the words that people are not supposed to use is actually more important than making a list of words that people are supposed to use, or at least equally important. I need to be able to look up my word. If my word <laughs> if, if my word's not supposed to be used and I look it up and it says don't use this, I'm like, bingo, I can't use that word. Which one should I use instead? Okay. They're very sophisticated, very fancy, very expensive multilingual terminology management systems out there that do this for you. But most companies start with either a table or a spreadsheet. Please use correct grammar, which goes back to the friend thing. Please. I didn't make this slide. So the, the person who does all of my graphics and my slides is a UNT student. It's not my son, but somebody else. So he decided that he wanted to put this sentence in. Young people have fewer opportunities, not less. And that depends on who you ask. <laughs> Go to the folder containing the files that you want. Go to the folder that contains the files that you want. Emails are blocked by the mail server that's actually passive. The mail server is blocking emails. That's active. OK. I'm mindful of the time. See? See how good I am? It's good. So a little bit about what I see happening today in the industry, because people ask me all the time. Translation needs are growing exponentially. And as you add languages, your issues and problems don't multiply by the number of languages. They exponentiate by the number of languages. So if you add four languages, you have problems to the fourth. If you add 12 languages, you have problems to the twelfth. Because you end up with this matrix that's like a 3D puzzle. We're still siloed. I've been hearing about silos for 25 years, and we're still siloed, just the way it is. We're siloed among our content groups, so the marketing writers don't talk to the technical writers, don't talk to the training developers, don't talk to the knowledge base writers, and we're all writing the same stuff. We're all writing the exact same stuff, but we don't talk to each other, and we just write it and rewrite it and rewrite it and rewrite it and translate and translate and translate and translate. And no wonder we have so much content, we don't know what to do with all the content. To say that there are silos between the content developers and the translators, it's like, <laughs> it's like a, a different country. It's a problem. We have too much content. I rarely get a customer now coming to me with not enough content. Customers call me and bring us in and pay us good money because they have all this content and they can't find it, they can't organize it, they can't manage it, and they all throw their hands in the air and they just write it all over again. Right? Oh, well, it's release 8.2. I know we did something for release 8.0 and 8.1, but you know I can't find it, so I'm just going to start all over again. And I use all different words now. And now I have to translate it all over again. 
And I use different words than training. So someone's taking training and they're like, is this the same product? I'll check the knowledge base. Uh-oh, I'm in big trouble now. My magic ball, where do I think we're going? Well, I can tell you for sure that AI is where we're going. I have two different talks that I do on AI. One is about natural language processing and how natural language processing is the heart of cognitive computing. So if you've heard of IBM Watson or, or uh, Google DeepMinds or whatever, at the heart of all of those systems is a natural language processor. A natural language processor is an artificial intelligence engine that understands the meaning of speech. And now they have natural language generators where the computers are writing the content. And I work with a company that does this, and I've seen this happen. Chatbots are just a front end. Chatbots are the interface between your customer and all that content that's on the other side in an automated way. They're very annoying. They're very annoying, right? Because they're always checking. Is this what you meant? Well, you said this. Is this what you meant? Oh, just put, put someone on the phone, because really, I've had enough. Right? Is this what you meant? You sure you meant this? Wait, you said this, but is this what you meant? It's getting better. I hate to tell you this, but these systems are going to be a total game changer for our industry. I hate to tell you this. They're going to change how we create, store, manage, publish, access content, including creating it. Artificial neural networks is another talk that I give. It's how machines are taught to learn. So we're teaching machines to learn like humans learn. I'll write a book. I'll let you know. So what do you do? Can you future-proof yourself? Well, the first thing I would say is make sure you know how to write in a structured environment, because all of my, con all of my customers are moving to structure. So make sure that you know how to write topic-based writing with taxonomy, metadata, all the things. Make sure you know all the things. Make sure you're following AI because it's going to replace some of our jobs. I have this slide in, in one of my AI talks with this person who wrote an article, and people like to say, oh, you know what? AI is not going to replace humans. It's going to allow us to do all these other great things. And I disagree. AI will replace a lot of what we do. Nobody wants to talk about it because it's uncomfortable. So make sure you keep up. I suggest you learn to code and be as technical as you can. I think that the next five to 10 years are going to be very big for computational linguistics. It's already a big field, but we have to have computational linguistics in order to program the AI engines, and they're being programmed. They're, this train has left the station. It's left the station. There will come a point where we don't have to teach the computers anything anymore, because the incremental changes they will be able to learn on their own. So you got to keep up with it. You need to know what's going on. The people who are already out there doing their jobs might not be keeping up too well. They don't see it coming, but it's coming. The marketing writers are all having like, they're like apoplectic. How can a computer write marketing content? It just reads enough of it and it can figure it out. Be as technical as you can. If you're going to go technical, Go really technical, because the easiest kind of instruction for a computer to write is turn on your phone, turn on your Bluetooth device. When this one beeps, put in 0000. zero, zero, zero. Yeah. <laughs> That's the easiest. Any machine can write that. So if you're going to go technical, my advice is to go really technical, really technical. 10 minutes for questions.
10 minutes for questions. So now you, I've been doing all the talking. Can you tell? And now it's time for don't be shy. OK, I'm going to try to hear you. I'm going to do my best. <laughs> when using jargon, um, how does that uh, play with translation? Like how, if I wanted to uh, tell another developer that, was, that spoke a different language mm -hmm. something very specific about, mm -hmm. let's say, like a phone or something, and I would use jargon mm -hmm. to like, describe like a certain microprocessor or something. Mm -hmm. Would I use the English for that, or would I do something? Or how, how would that translate into their language? How would I do that? That's a really good question. So the, the question is, how do I do this with jargon? How do, how do I tell someone, well, this is really what I meant, right? Well, there are a few ways to approach this. What it, depending on the company, if the company is like a GoPro, where their whole world is jargon, my advice to GoPro is to treat jargon as a translation. So you write it using the boring, simplest words you possibly can. It's, you know, it's time to wake up. It's time to get out of bed. And then you treat your jargon as a translation, rise and shine. So you're maintaining two versions of English, which happens to help if you're also dealing with UK English, South African English, Australian English, even Canadian English. So that's, that's sort of the, the gestalt way of doing it. On a onesie twosie basis, my advice is don't, <laughs> don't use jargon. I had a big battle with GoPro about this. I, I lost, obviously, because that's their brand. So if you have influence, if you're not in what we call a B2C, which is business to consumer, right? If, if you're not Apple or GoPro, if you're, if you're making products for other companies, you, you stand a better chance of being able to eliminate the jargon. It's just that it's creeping into everything, and it's really difficult to deal with. So those are sort of the two ways. On a macro level, treat it as a translation. Oh, got two. Oh, um, how would you implement kind of this global um, content strategy and structured authoring into a small scale? So like one department or one group or team, how would you start moving in that direction? Another good question. Everybody hear it? How would you implement uh, structured authoring and a global content strategy into a single department, maybe even a small team? It's a really good question. Um, we can implement structure anywhere, any place with any tools. Part of the, the fear of structure is that the tools can be very expensive, right? Component content management systems and XML authoring tools and all this. But Using Word, we can implement a structure. A structure is nothing more than something that is standardized and repeatable. So for example, the easiest example would be a hardware document. Right? So I get my widget, and there are certain things I have to do. I have to take the widget out of the box. Right? I have to show this is all the pieces that came with the widget. This is how I install the widget. If you have seven widgets, you want to make sure that every document about installing the widget looks exactly the same. It always starts with, here's what's in the box. It always is followed by, here's how you mount it. It's always followed by, here's how you plug it in, don't put your tongue in the socket. <laughs> right? It's always followed by the little blue light flashes. So. We need, when we think of structure, we can start on a very small scale that basically says, I'm setting up, um, I, I, I'm setting up just the, the flow of how things are going to go. I'm setting up an expectation that when you, Mr. Customer, buy one of my software products, hardware products, services, whatever, even if I have 20 of them, you always know this is the way our content moves. We start with this, we go to this, we go to this. So we can start small. 
And when we're talking about global content strategy, we can start small with simple writing, with very simple writing. We can really look at what we've written and said, and say, is this really the, the fewest number of words I can use to get this point across? Or did I kind of flowery it up a bit? I made that up, flowery it up a bit. We can say the same thing the same way every time. I'm always going to select OK. It seems really simple, but we can start small. And then when we get bigger and we want to buy the tools and put you know, the money in and go to XML and do all the tagging, our documents already look and read the way they're supposed to. And now converting them and going from a monolithic document into little topics is easy because I've already created that format. So those are some of the things that you can do now, even on a very small scale, that will have big imp impacts later on. Is that? Yes, help? absolutely. Great. Great. Question. And then I'll get you. Um, what role do linguistic experts play considering the rise of AI? Like in terms of uh, like global content, uh, how, how, are they, how is the content being verified as Think of the word. I'm trying to figure out, like, considering that we're thinking about global uh, content, like, how do we understand whether or not the content is effective? Uh, and what role? Do, oh, like, in another language. Yeah, do you what role do linguistic ex ex experts play considering the rise of AI? Okay, so what role do linguistic experts play in uh, knowing if our translated content is effective? Knowing if our translated content is effective is a big thing, is a complicated thing. And theoretically, that's what the translation companies are supposed to do. However, there is a role, um, there's a very important role in translation of a subject matter expert, which is a different subject matter expert than the people that we as tech writers deal with. It's not the engineers or the product managers. These are in-country people whose job needs to be read this and make sure it makes sense in this language. Rating efficacy, even in English, never mind in another language, there are different ways to do it. Sometimes we do it by, um, in TechCom, the number of support calls. If, tech, if my writing is better, then my support calls should be lower. Right? If my writing stinks, then people are going to call because they can't figure out what to do. The same is true in every other language as well. It really depends upon the company. There are tools that will score. So there are tools that will score English, and there are tools that will score other languages as well. Um, unfortunately, in, what usually happens is that we find out our content isn't working because people complain. That's what usually happens, unfortunately. It's kind of like, well, no, good is, no news is good news. And when I have news, it's bad news. So it's an ongoing issue. There are ways to mitigate it, um, but it, it remains. And a lot of it is the company's determination to care, the company's yeah. determination to really yeah. want to make sure that the content works in all languages. Not a great answer. I was a little wishy on that answer, I know. <laughs> it's best I can do. It's, it's almost 5 o'clock, so. Um, does global content strategy affect SEO? And if it does, then is it a lot different in other countries for SEO? It's a great question. Global content strategy and SEO. Yes, there's a huge, huge impact of global content strategy and SEO. In fact, I talk about it in the book. I was, I know you want to leave, it's you and the beer or something. I understand, there's only me between, that's what we say at conferences. There's only me between you and the cocktail. The, if you're the last, if, you know, pity, pity the last person to go on the last day. Anyway, um, I was on the Four Seasons website, right, like gazillion dollar rooms, and I was searching in Russian, not that I speak Russian, but I just wanted to see what the experience was like. And all of a sudden, it popped me back to English. Because they only translated like the first two pages. 
Can I still search in Russian? I don't know, because I don't know Russian. But there's a huge implication. So when I translate, my multilingual sites each need to be um, optimized for search in their language. But far too often, we don't translate the whole site into all 127 languages. I was on some other site, and I was looking in French. It was a shopping site, and I couldn't figure out how to return something. And I kind of speak French, so I used like every word for return. I couldn't search to return something in French. I could buy it in French. I could pay for it in euros, but I couldn't return it. I had to speak English to return it. So it's a huge implication. And uh, people don't think about it. Even if you don't translate everything, you need to be able to search for everything. It's big, big, big. So it is five, uh, 451, and I thank you. You guys have been great. If you have more questions, I can stick around. But thank you. Go have whatever beer, cocktail, whatever. Thank you.